Monticello. Um, I'm, Pe I'm Peggy Cornett, curator of plants at Monticello. <laughs> and I'm here with... I'm Michael Tricomi. I'm the manager and curator of Historic Gardens. And we're um, sitting in the midst of the vegetable garden today. Um, Monticello House is above us. And uh, we're more or less facing east, southeast, um, which is how the vegetable garden was situated on this slope of the mountain. Um, it's a thousand foot long garden. So in the background, you're gonna see this garden pavilion and that's standing at the midpoint of the vegetable garden. Um, at this time of year, of course, everything, uh, harvest is, a, is the big topic of the day. And um, we're also enjoying some, some lovely weather this, this time of year. Jefferson once wrote that spring and fall make a paradise of our, of our country. And uh, he especially loved this time of year, and, and I do too as well. So but it's, a, um, it's just a great time. And we, we brought a lot of, of things uh, harvested, uh, that have harvested from the garden that we want to talk about today yeah. and just share um, uh, some of the, the, uh, the harvest from the garden. Yeah, some garden updates and what we're doing this time of year. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a lot of uh, produce harvesting happening here at Monticello. Uh, you can see we have a whole variety of uh, late summer crops coming in. Uh, and this time of year, we're also starting our fall crops or, or have started our fall crops by this time. Um, we have a variety of uh, tomatoes. Thomas Jefferson was, um, you know, grew a, a few different types of tomatoes or recorded a few different types of tomatoes in his garden book. Uh, this one here is the Castelluto Genovese. It's a very, very old Italian heirloom uh, that we uh, grow in the gardens and have grown in the gardens for, for many years. And it's really representative of the uh, historic or, uh, varieties of tomatoes, the kind of the ancient types of tomatoes that have those very deep ridged flesh, a skin to it. Uh, Castelluto actually means uh, ridged or, mm -hmm. or and um, so Castelluto Genovese means it's coming from a, a ridged tomato coming from the area of, called Castelluto uh, Genovese in, in Italy. Um, it's, it has a lot of seed in it, it's very pulpy, it but it, I, I really prefer these heirloom tomatoes to the more modern types. And um, we've Definitely. grown this one for many years in the garden. Yeah, that's yeah. a favorite. It's, it's very, very acidic. It's a really, really wonderful tomato. That and the purple calabash are, are two uh, tomatoes in particular that we, uh, yes. that we grow in the gardens today. And we're also um, beginning to harvest a lot of uh, the, the, the squashes and the, the late yes. season um, um, pumpkins, you might say. Yep. Um, pumpkins you may and winter squash. Talk about this, this big boy here on the yeah, ground. Yeah, so um, this here <laughs> is our green striped Cushaw squash. Um, it's said to have originated in the West Indies. Uh, they can get rather large. They can get, you know, close to 30 pounds. Um, they are, you know, mildly sweet. They're really great for baking. Um, and so it makes, you know, you, you can do a lot of different things with, with this squash here. And it, it um, keeps very well. You can, you know, does. store it for several months in, the, mm -hmm. in, uh, in a cool part of your house. It's quite ornamental, I think. I think it's beautiful in the garden. It is. And it's, yeah. you know, very... Uh, uh, Bug free in a sense. I mean, it's very healthy plant and it is. vine. It's, it doesn't get a lot of the resistant to those pesky squash vine borers. Yeah. So it's yeah, it, it usually does very well in the gardens thing. here. Yeah, and again, we've grown that that variety for many years as mm -hmm. well. Um, another crop that that's uh, really surprising to people is the fact that we grow artichokes. Um, Jefferson was actually rather um, pleased that he was able to bring artichokes to table. This is a Mediterranean mm -hmm. crop. Of course, in California, it's grown, you know, commercially, and it really prefers a, a sandy, uh, well-drained soil. But, you know, we've been very successful with it, and it was cultivated in, in at Monticello for, for many years. And um, what you're looking at now is uh, when we've allowed the artichoke, uh, the part that you eat, to go to, go to flower. So it, it's actually in bloom now, which is quite beautiful. And um, you can see that it's in the thistle family. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this color will last for a long time if you pick it now, which we have done now, and we will uh, let it dry. And it, it almost preserves itself as an everlasting. Um, we have a, a popular mm -hmm. event every year um, in late November and December called the, uh, well, the, the wreath workshop uh, uh, 
event, which has been going on for probably close to 35, 40 years yeah, now at like Monticello. That. And some of the, the items we select for it and dry include um, uh, beautiful things like the artichokes as well as tansy and, and other flowers, uh, mm -hmm. dried flowers that can be added to, to decorative wreaths. So, so that is includes the coxcomb and that the, we have here as that's well. That's right. Yes, the coxcomb is another more or less an everlasting flower. This is mm -hmm. from the flower garden. Um, <laughs> this is one. <laughs> one head. One head, I guess you would call it. <laughs> Um, it's massive. Um, and, uh, you know, people, especially young people, think they look like brains in the garden. <laughs> but um, you're really not looking at flower petals at all. It's sort of like an appendage, I guess. The, right. the actual flowers are, they have very insignificant petals. In fact, I don't think they have petals at all, but they're, they're, they flower against the flattened part of this stalk. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you can, when we begin to collect seed of the coxcomb, we're going to scrape off these um, seed heads here on against the the, uh, the stem of the flower, and there are little black seeds in here, and there are quite a few here. I'm sure our flower gardener is going to want to get this back so she can <laughs> save these seeds. Yes. This is a particularly nice um, uh, form of the coxcomb. There's a lot of variation in coxcomb, mm -hmm. but uh, we do try to select from the the biggest and most beautiful heads in the garden yeah to keep those uh those traits going for sure yeah they're absolutely loaded with seed and that's, yeah, they're all over my hands all over your hands. yeah that's okay and, and that really speaks to another uh activity that we're getting into this time of year especially is our, our seed saving we, we have a seed saving program here at mm -hmm. monticello um, a number of jefferson era varieties are grown yep. in the gardens here uh, as well as 19th century varieties we try to keep those uh, varieties going try to preserve them uh, for future generations. Yeah, and the, uh, the coxcomb was one of the earliest flowers Jefferson mentioned in his garden book. Uh, he kept a diary um, of gardening activities at Monticello from 1766 when he was just 23 years old until two years before his death in 1824. He died in 1826. And so this is a remarkable um, documentation for us to use as far mm -hmm. as, as, as um, searching for the appropriate vegetables in the yes. garden and the types of flowers and um it just it's, it's a wealth of information it is so, and, um, and very few contemporaries took uh, such right. meticulous notes yes he was he was very uh which is was one of the best documented gardens in that regard right um, in in the country absolutely I think. and, and a, a relate a relative of the coxcomb is the love lies bleeding <laughs> um which is kind of unusual it's they're both members of the amaranth mm -hmm. family and you may, some of you may uh, buy amaranth cereal in the grocery store now. It's very popular. Right. Not, <laughs> I me, don't not for me. But. I, I like it. It's really good. It, it, it's a grain crop. And mm -hmm. um, uh, the leaves are also edible. You know, they're like a, a spinach crop, a green. Sure, yeah. And um, same with the um, Joseph's Coat. is another member of the amaranth family. But this is called Love Lies Bleeding, <laughs> Amaranthus caudatus. And it, again, it's a very early... Uh, flower documented by Jefferson. The seeds on, on this plant, again, are just tiny little beads mm -hmm. and they're uh, uh, pale uh, color, kind of a tan color. So they're not the black hard seeds that you find for the coxcomb. So they're quite different. It's easy to tell them apart. But that's the same kind of grain that you would crush to make amaranth flower or, or you know, so right. but it's a South American um, plant. And these, and these how, are all tropical. How tall plants. would you say that plant? Is, oh, Peggy? well, they can get over your head. They're rather you know. tall. Yeah. I'm a, you know, <laughs> I like to say I'm five five. I might, I think I'm getting shorter, but um, but yeah, they, they'll definitely grow that high. And um, the Joseph's coat can also get quite tall in the garden as well. Yes. On a, in a good summer. Definitely. So, so those are fun um, flowers in the garden. And people are always asking questions about them uh, when they when they spot them out there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, this is a great time of year, um, not only for the vegetable garden, but for the flower garden as, as well. A lot of a lot of great color yeah. uh, showing through there. Just wanted to also show, you know, as, as Michael said, we are seed saving at this time of year. And um, I just picked, uh, a lot of people are very interested in our, our plant labels in mm -hmm. the garden. They are uh, created, uh, they're just wooden stakes that have the Latin and English name on them, the common name. And um, when people come to Monticello, they can s figure out uh, when they see the top of that stake, it has a TJ, which means Thomas Jefferson. That's kind of a, 
a nickname we use for Thomas Jefferson mm -hmm. when you work here. And then below it is a date. And this particular uh, date is 1808. And the, the crop is the asparagus bean. And it's, it's quite a, uh, I think it's a lovely vine in the garden, uh, the oh, vegetable garden. It, mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's um, related to black eyed peas. Here, these are some dried pods but you can cook it uh, when it's green or tender and, and right. slice it up. Jefferson um, talked about uh, this, this bean to his son-in-law, uh, John Wales Epps. And he also, um, here's, I don't know if you can see this or not, but the seeds are quite, quite beautiful, actually. They're mm -hmm. black, uh, hard, Dark shiny seed. seeds. There they are. And, um, uh, you know, the, a lot of the, the recipes um, that come down to us uh, from Jefferson's day, uh, talked about uh, cooking or pre preparing things as you would asparagus. Mm -hmm. And so asparagus would be um, either, you know, sauteed or, or baked or, but they often used um, a lot of butter with them. So they said in the French yes. style, which I think means a lot of butter. A lot of butter. <laughs> so, yes. um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of um, vegetables and crops that uh, could be used as substitutes, you know, in, in recipes. That's that's a great example of one. You know, uh, we're also growing the salsify plant, right. um, or also known as oyster plant. Um, and because it's supposed to have a uh, taste that resembles that of an oyster, so you can use it in a similar way uh, in soups and, and dishes. Um, it's the root of the plant that you harvest. You dig right. it out and it, it's a beautiful, it's very when you kind of like a carrot peeler, I guess, and, and it's very yes. white, just like oysters. And um, uh, I, again, I think it's cooked with butter, that sort of thing. Plenty yeah. of butter, Plenty yes, of butter. definitely. <laughs> um, uh, and that's something that we have currently in, growing in the garden as well. Uh, we save seed from that uh, as well, and that is a, a biennial. So it takes, mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to wait until the second year for it to form seed and until you can harvest. And, and it has a beautiful flower. There's a yellow version, a form, and a purple one, mm -hmm. which you have in the garden, the purple form. Um, it also can naturalize along roadsides, I think. I've seen it in yes. fields. But it's in the dandelion family, so it, it makes a seed pod that's, that's similar to a dandelion when it um, sheds its seeds. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and Peggy also mentioned the, the plant labels that we have in the garden. Mm -hmm. Again, we use Thomas Jefferson's garden book for... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of our documentation, um, you know, those notes are really, really uh, helpful to us uh, yeah, the, in, in researching what was what was being grown here. Yeah, the date is meant to signify the first time Jefferson mentions this crop, mm -hmm. but it may uh, be repeated throughout uh, for over several years. So that's just right. Eight, uh, 1809 was the first year he mentions asparagus beans. So. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have okra, it's kind of controversial crop. Mm -hmm. um, I really like it. It's, <laughs> it can be a little. Uh, it's polarizing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but um, actually, if you pick it very small, it's not as as slimy as it gets as it gets older. Mm -hmm. um, but it, um, and it's a it's a beautiful crop in the garden. It's in the uh, hibiscus family. Yes. So the flower is like a big yellow hibiscus in yeah, the garden. No, it's, it's a large and um, it was very important in, in, in various dishes that uh, resemble what today we call uh, gumbo. Mm -hmm. um, and they they had a name for it, which was very similar to the word gumbo. But it was using um, okra, um, potatoes, which are unusual, and, and uh, lima beans and peppers and so forth. And yes. so uh, there's several recipes that come down to us and um, they can, they're kind of described in, in um, uh, a cookbook by uh, Mary Randolph that was uh, she was a relation to the Jefferson family and her cookbook the um, uh, Virginia housewife Virginia was published housewife. in the 1820s yes and there also you can find a lot of information in the book this book by Peter Hatch the director emeritus of gardens and grounds at Monticello and he he gives a long description of, of all of these vegetables including um, this recipe for um, Use uh, using uh, the the okra in a gum and gumbo. gumbo stew or yeah and um, so uh, this is a great book to have for all sorts of reasons but it's absolutely especially for the histories of these vegetables we um again looking through Jefferson's garden book uh, there was mention of tomatoes and okra being planted that's right mm -hmm. within the same square at, at least one year. Tomatoes were surrounded by okra, sort of a, a wall of okra around the, the tomatoes that were planted in the garden. Uh, and so this year, 
to recreate that, we planted them side by side in the same uh, square. Of course, the vegetable garden is divided into 24 uh, plots or garden plots or, or squares, as Jefferson called them, um, with the first being solely reserved for asparagus and the rest of the it's sort of an unnumbered square and the rest of them uh, rotated out from year to year. Um, Jefferson did practice crop rotation. Mm -hmm. And this time of year, we are gearing up for doing the same thing as we're taking things out of the garden. We will be uh, switching where uh, the next crops will be grown uh, for the fall, as well as the upcoming spring season. Yeah, I, I might have failed to mention that tomato is an essential ingredient in gumbo too, which right. is, yes, having them yes. side by side was just a, a wonderful kind of a, a image of the two crops growing Definitely. growing together. Um, but yeah, the um, this time of year, some beds are being cleared out. You're also planting uh, some cover crops, I think, to... Um, we do replenish the uh, the fertility the, of the soil. The soil, and, yeah, it's mm -hmm. really important uh, having a good, strong foundation for your for your crops. So we we do uh, employ cover crops in the garden here to display, um, you know, some more of those field crops. You know, we plant uh, winter wheat and rye. Uh, we do clover as well as winter peas. So there's a nice variety, and different cover crops are great for different things, whether it's fixing nitrogen or just adding a lot of good organic matter back into the soil. Um, it's a really great um, method of, uh, of sort of nourishing our, our garden beds because we do plant in them so often. All over and over. Yes. And it's kind of reflective of when the garden was first um, completed in 1809. That was the year Jefferson retired mm -hmm. from his second term as president. And he was directing the um, uh, improvement of the, of the beds before the garden was planted. And uh, we know that uh, one of the enslaved gardeners that was really essential at Monticello, who we read a lot about in the documents, was a man named Wormley Hughes. And he was charged with actually going to, um, to, to a nearby farm, or a uh, Milton farm, and, um, and bringing wagon loads of manure to um, replenish the soil, to really build up the soil at that point. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the um, occupations of of uh, what, what you would do in, in advance of, of planting, of intensive planting. And so, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that was a very important uh, part of the garden and something you still do today. We, we mm -hmm. had compost a lot. Um, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, in Jefferson's time, exactly. Manure was, was definitely- That was the essential. You know, that, that was one of the, the heavier amendments uh, in the garden for sure. And Wormley was instrumental in, in that yeah. process from year to year. Yes, um, he, he's he's mentioned often in the garden book, both with the vegetable garden and the flower garden as far as right, work in the garden. Right. And um, it's, it's also important to know um, just how how the soil itself is 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 quite unusual in a sense. It's called Davidson loam and it's a very heavy um, uh, kind of a clay based soil. Right. But it's it's a it's a very uh, rich soil in many ways, rich in minerals and iron and uh, a deep a deep loam mm -hmm. so um but when the vegetable garden was was um terraced a lot of the soil was moved from one side of the hill to the other to make it leveled and so again they had to to build up that soil in some some areas because it's probably kind of thin yeah um, yeah it's, it's always a task starting a new garden bed or a, a planting area you know you, you want to make sure you have that again that strong foundation for whatever you're growing there um so yeah, always starting from scratch, it's always great to add in all those amendments, whether it's uh, compost, mulch. Uh, we use a lot of leaf litter as well. You know, leaves that we collect around the mountaintop, we'll add them back into our beds and, and incorporate them into the soil. Um, so there's a lot of different things. Our cover crops, as we mentioned. What, what cover crops are you planning to grow, grow this year? Um, yeah, um, we, so, some some from last year. So okay. last year we did uh, some winter rye. We did winter wheat. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a square totally devoted to uh, winter peas, which was yes. really really interesting. That was, nice, that was yeah. the first year we had uh, that I had done that here. Um, we've, in the past we've done clover. Um, which clover is a, good... is a great yeah. legume to use mm -hmm. uh, for nitrogen fixing. Yes, mm -hmm. um, and then. Yeah, those, those are the main, those are the main, those ones, are the main yeah. cover mm -hmm. crops that we've used. Uh, another one that um, we've been using as a cover crop is uh, mustard as well. Oh. Um, sort of, uh, you know, a 
plant in the bra brassica family that is really good for keeping some pests away as well as an added bonus. So. I, I'm, I'm still waiting for that bed of turnips. I really want a whole square. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind yes. of a popular thing. In, yes, in, definitely. In, in, in devoting a garden to turnips. But um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so yeah, the um, another uh, uh, another vegetable down here that we haven't talked about yet is is this plant or this this actually actually mm -hmm. kind of a na Native American um, vegetable called uh, that was called simlins. C y M L I N G. Sometimes there's a <laughs> and G. And sometimes drop the G, you know. But it we call it patty pan squash. That's mm -hmm. more of the modern name for it. It's a it's de a delightful squash. It's it's very mild. Jefferson said it was an innocent vegetable. I'm not quite sure what that meant, but anyway, it maybe just because it's white, I don't know. But it's um it always stays kind of a pure white. Um it never kind of gets uh, uh kind of rusty or darker yeah. in the garden. It stays this color, but it has a really thin skin on it mm -hmm. too. Um so you can you can just uh, slice it mm -hmm. um and use it as is really. It doesn't even require peeling. It doesn't have a large seed chamber in it. So uh, right. yeah. Right. Yeah, and it's it's a lovely yeah. It's a lovely crop. And then um, we also have, um, well, th this is a pepper. <laughs> we grow a lot of peppers in the garden. Um, you didn't pick my favorite, the Texas bird pepper. The but, Texas bird, uh, yeah, yes. But, but that's the hot pepper. But this is a, what we all know as the um, bell pepper. Mm -hmm. um, they were called bullnose peppers, um, which is a great description of, of a pepper. But um, this is when it has gotten red, but you know, it starts out green, of course, and then as they ripen, they get red in the garden. This is kind of the perfect time for this pepper for me to take home and slice up. <laughs> yes, definitely. But, um, uh, I don't know, we don't save, sell save seed of these, do we? Peppers are tricky to save seed because okay. they require such a large isolation distance. Okay. You have to separate them by quite, quite, a, quite a long way uh, in order to save pure seed. Otherwise you can get you know, crossing happening okay. in your peppers. Some sweet peppers can even become hot. Yes. I've, I've been told. So that's happened. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, by mistake, I think. But right. Where it was believed to be a sweet pepper and then it turned out to be quite hot. And if you get that on your hands or in your eyes, it's, it's not a good thing. Right. Right. But here's one of the hot ones, the cayenne pepper. And this was still, you know, the same thing. It hasn't changed at all since Jefferson's time, I think. I mean, yeah. if you see old, uh, illustrations of of this pepper dating back to the 1500s um these are all of course from south america same with the tomato mm -hmm. and um so uh and, but and the, go the, ahead. there are some different varieties mm -hmm. maybe more modern varieties of them but relatively they're unchanged from from jefferson's mm -hmm. time sometimes and, I, I even keep them in my pocket oh, just to snack on <laughs> yeah. for later you don't snack anyway well the texas bird pepper you don't want to snack on it's a tiny red pepper right and it was sent to jefferson by a um a, a, well it was a, an army captain um in san antonio texas and he sent it was what 18 14 15 somewhere in there he sent jefferson yes. seed and it's a native to uh, the Texas uh, region down into um, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. common in cuisine. They, they call it ch chilipaquin, I believe. Yep. And um, mm -hmm. so uh, Jefferson was quite intrigued by it. He thought it might be a, a hardier pepper in the garden. The reason it's called a bird pepper is because um, it's so hot that, you know, it's uh, that it's the type of pepper that only birds can eat because it's it's just very um, very hot and birds yes. don't have the taste bud that will sense the heat. Yeah, um, and, mammals tend to stay away from. Yes, them. Was, that's right. <laughs> Little critters. Don't, yeah, it's good don't for usually. repelling. Um, mm -hmm. If you get bird seed nowadays um, uh, at the uh, bird bird seed store, they you can buy um, seed and um, uh, suet that has pepper or capsicum added to it. Um, so that the squirrels won't eat it because mm -hmm. it's just so hot but but birds love it of course because yeah. they don't taste the very smart the pepper yeah it's great <laughs> and i guess you can put it in, in the garden it might repel your deer if you have a problem with that yeah, <laughs> it'll take a lot of pepper <laughs> there's such a thing as capsaicin mm -hmm. sprays and we get this question That's a lot right. in the gardens you know do we have critters that in the in the monticello gardens and and yes we we do we do have our share um luckily we have a deer fence that surrounds the mountaintop which mm -hmm. is great at repelling um, some of those larger animals like deer, uh, which can be a, a, a big problem at, in the home garden, especially, and at farms. Um, but we have our share of, you know, small uh, groundhogs you know, and groundhogs yeah. and rabbits, <laughs> rabbits and yeah. all kinds of things in the garden as the well. The deer fence was 
just put in a, in a couple of years ago. And so yes. up until that point, we were heavily predated by deer. Um, we had a, right. a heavy deer population. and um, But this fence runs around the mountain a couple of miles along. And, yeah, about uh, two miles. It yeah. runs through the woods. So people ask us a lot because it's a common um, issue for gardeners who, are, who live in areas that have deer um, over populations of deer. So mm -hmm. it's it's kind of unfortunate for the, the animals, but um, if you can keep them out of your, your own special garden, that, that's the best way. I think. Right, yeah. right. We do also have a, a number of foxes on the mountaintop too. Well, yeah. And I have, and I have, I'm sure that they help in uh, in repelling some of the other uh, critters yeah, that's a good from thing the garden have. as well. They're great. They're, we love but them. But fox will eat fruit, I think. I've, I've they heard they will eat grapes from time to time. And that sort of yeah. thing. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One thing he was also, uh, Michael was also mentioning about seed saving is um, there's different methods of seed saving. And the tomatoes are one of the, the mm -hmm. fruits that it's a fruit. <laughs> and you have to really save the seed in a as a wet um uh, you, you have to 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 um, if, ferment the scoop seeds. it out, ferment it. Yeah, right. it's wet fermentation. You scoop yeah. it out and you put it with a, with some water into a bucket and get a slurry going. And you have to it, it gets a little messy, but you you kind of skim off any mold that gets on it. And yeah, after a few you're... days, the mm -hmm. fermentation um, uh, will uh, dissolve the stickiness that's on that seed. And right. then you can rinse it off. You know, hose it down really well and put it out. Uh, it's nice to have it on a nice dry day, put mm -hmm. it on newspaper or a, a screen and let it dry out. Yeah. And tomato seeds are just like little tiny, you know, papery things. They so, are. Yeah. And they're quite fuzzy yeah, after they fuzzy. dry. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, fermentation is a great uh, way to, to save seed from any anything with that sort of sticky or gel coating, like tomatoes, uh, eggplant, sort of has that or cucumbers yeah I know um, those. that's that's another great one i to, guess you have to, to do that, that with way. the pumpkins and all those yeah some like, yeah some, sometimes yeah. yeah yeah definitely getting it's it's a process of working through some of the you know the insides of squash you know rinsing and uh and you know working through that is it it's it's definitely it takes it takes some time and and some uh some patience but it's well worth it in the end and the seed that we re-preserve and package and make available to the public um this is all done by hand here at monticello by by the by the staff in the gardens and yeah at monticello and at the center for historic plants as well so and it's and it really brings the garden full circle because mm -hmm. we're, we're we're we do all you know all or most of our sowing and and growing of these plants that we that we display in the vegetable and the flower garden mm -hmm. Um, you know, we care for them throughout the year, and then when it comes time, we save seed from them. And, That's and right, carry them to the next year. Into the next year, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, and then another question that we that we're often asked is what we do with, uh, you know, especially the vegetables oh, that, yeah. that we grow in the garden. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and there's a number of different things that we use them for. You know, we we have donated a lot locally. Um, you know, reach out to uh, food banks, local food mm -hmm. banks. We also have a cafe here at the uh, at our visitor center, uh, farm the table Monticello cafe, visitor yeah. center. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the mm -hmm. farm table cafe. Um, and then we make some products for our shop, uh, including our, some of our peppers that we grow, get made into pepper jelly. They Wonderful. become salsa, <laughs> um, hot sauce. And then we also bloody make Mary mix. a Bloody That's Mary mix from our tomatoes. <laughs> That's a big hit. Um, mm. So yeah, we do a number of different things from them. Uh, seed saving, of course. So uh, they go a lot of different, um, a lot of different places. I really recommend the hot pepper jelly. I just love. It. Oh, it's <laughs> fantastic! It's I grew up yeah. with. My mother used to make it, but this is the ones we have are even better. I think I have yeah. to say. How do you normally? eat it uh, oh um well with a little cream cheese on a cracker sure. it's really good that's... But, or just breakfast i uh, put it on toast mm -hmm. and yep. yeah mm -hmm. that's usually how i how i've had it but i'm sure well. there's wonderful recipes you can use it definitely for. Yeah. now how do you save the seed of this little guy so those so <laughs> little little spinning gourds we usually let them uh just totally dry out because they're i mean they're pretty dense they're hard they, they have some weight to them when uh yeah. when they're still green but once they're dried out mm -hmm. um you could just take a hammer or just kind of smash them open and they're just absolutely full of seeds okay which is now you um great. uh this was a, a little gourd that jefferson actually um drew a made a drawing of so it's it's, it's very very interesting yeah. and, and it's very historic but um um you know we do use it a lot when we have these um uh 
home homeschool days and yes and, um, kids love uh, them and <laughs> summer camp and the kids just love to play with them but they'll, they'll hold this color for quite a while um like a gourd you know, gourd display so mm -hmm. um it's not something you're going to eat <laughs> i don't think right. i think it's more of a decorative it item is. in the garden but, we, uh, yeah we, we one year we we strung them together in sort of a series oh almo yeah almost made, like uh lights for holiday time yeah it made it look like christmas lights yeah. around the tree but it was out of, out yeah of they're, these. they're really that great for fun. crafts and for decoration yeah as well as to spin they do they do spin very well i don't know if it yeah oh, oh. <laughs> anyway put yeah. it on the ground and then you see how long long they'll spin for you yeah, which is yeah, fun yeah. it's a it's a great thing for kids what is this uh watermelon here is that Yes, that's uh, we we love this variety. It's the mountain sweet watermelon. Um, mm -hmm. It's very hard to come by. It's a very rare watermelon, um, and there are two strains of it. It's there's a red fleshed and a yellow flesh strain, mm -hmm. um, and we we grow the the red flesh strain here in the garden. Um, it is absolutely, I think, the most delicious watermelon. With a name I've like had. mountain sweet. How can you go wrong? Yes, it's <laughs> it's fantastic. Now, um, where did you normally? Where did you originally get the seed? Was this from David Shields or this seed? Oh. This seed we've uh, was was passed down from, oh, okay. from the yeah. previous vegetable gardener. So okay. we've we've been saving it um, at least for you know for several years now. Well, we do have we kind of collaborate, you might say, with other heirloom mm -hmm. seed companies and people who uh, uh, preserve these seeds, such as uh, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, and they've helped us to preserve uh, and make available a lot of our vegetables, including the uh, tennis ball lettuce and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So. A lot of times we kind of scour their magazine and every year and uh, yeah. see what we need to add to the garden. It's sort of Jeffersonian too, yeah. sort of looking for, uh, sort of hunting for these uh, these More lost old varieties. Lost yeah, varieties. These, are... these different varieties mm -hmm. is is definitely something that we're we're interested in doing. So and so yeah, I mean I think we've covered a lot of ground here, and um, we're just uh, hope you'll come and visit Monticello whenever you're in, in this part of the world, but you can also visit us on our, our website. We do podcasts uh, once a we month. Uh, tomorrow we're going to do another one. Yeah. It's called A Rich Spot of Earth, so you can find it when you go to the monticello.org website. And of course, as I mentioned, we have a lot of um, uh, seed available on our website uh, through our catalog, online catalog, seed from our gardens. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a Facebook page that's called Monticello Farm and Garden garden facebook page and again we have quite a few um uh followers on our social media so definitely uh check us out whenever you're you're able to do that and uh, we yeah. always enjoy talking to people we love to hear from you definitely yeah.